We'll, we'll begin and allow the stragglers to come in as we, as we talk and listen. Um, I'm Ken Wallach. I'm president of NDI, and I want to welcome you to this first in a series of events on disinformation and the challenges that it uh, poses to democracy. Uh, the hashtag for the series of events. Okay. The hashtag for the series of events is hashtag disinfoweek. And today's briefing will be followed by a digital disinformation forum that is being organized by NDI and Stanford University next Monday and Tuesday, that's June 26th and 27th, in Palo Alto. Then on Thursday, June 29th, the Atlantic Council and Germany's Konrad Adenauer Foundation will host an event in D.C. Uh, at the Atlantic Council on the threat of Russian influence in Europe. Uh, the next frontier in digital uh, disinformation and how best to respond. NDI's chairman, Madeleine Albright, will provide the keynote remarks at that event. Uh, we are delighted to host this event with the Oxford Internet Institute's project on algorithms, computational propaganda, and digital politics. Uh, there are very few issues affecting democracy that are more urgently in need of greater research, understanding, and action by policymakers and the tech industry. Democracy, as we all know, requires that people are able to access information and engage in constructive, informed political discourse. This has always been influenced by new technology. This was true with the rise of political pamphleteers in the Middle Ages following the creation of the printing press. In the 1980s, Poland's Solidarity used the cassette tapes to disseminate political cabaret, anthems, and audio books and essays. It was also true in the context of the Tunisian and Egyptian revolutions of 2011, when Twitter was used to facilitate collective action. But we also know from history that initial views about the impact of technological change were incomplete at best. In the wake of the so-called Twitter revolutions, uh, there were technologists who presented a cyber utopian or a cyber, cyber optimist view of the impact of social media on democracy, whereby increased internet access would inevitably lead to more open societies. This has since given way to a, perhaps a more realistic and darker view of the impact of social media on democratic discourse with a number of serious academics and individuals asking how democracy can weather the social media. While Gonim, the Egyptian activist whose Facebook posts helped ignite the Egyptian revolution, warns us of this phenomenon. Social media, he said, was once seen as a, uh, as a means, a liberating means, to speak truth to power. Now the issue is how to speak truth to social media. The online public square is privately owned by major corporations, but have not been held to the same standards as traditional news outlets. They have resisted, perhaps understandably, responsibility for the dissemination of rumors, propaganda, and disinformation, claiming to simply be platforms. There is no single culprit to blame for the democratic deficits caused by the rise of social media and the disinformation and junk news that has followed in its wake. Much of the media focus, on the U focus in the U.S. has been on Russian meddling in the U.S. elections. This is a clear national security issue, impacting not only election integrity, but also national security. But it is also true that we would need to address the issues being raised during Disinfo Week, even if the Putin regime were to disappear tomorrow. The tools and techniques of computational propaganda continue to metastasize within the body politique. They are being used not only by authoritarian regimes around the globe to project power and advance national security interests, but are also widely used by domestic political actors and other non-state actors. To date, it is clear that the response by governments and the tech industry has been insufficient to address the challenge. To turn things around, we need at least two things. First, data and analysis to better understand the nuances of the challenge, which continues to evolve at an exponential rate. And two, 
greater urgency among those in government, philanthropy, the democracy community, and the tech community to collaborate to address these challenges at scale. On the first point, we look forward to hearing the remarkable research from Oxford this morning on how computational propaganda is shaping politics in nine countries covered by the case studies. I returned over the weekend from Georgia and Ukraine, where Oxford's study shows the most globally advanced case of computational propaganda. This serious challenge is now uh, quite evident uh, during, during our visit. We need to support this research to better understand how politics are currently being conducted online and how democratic deficits are being created or exacerbated by social media and bots. On the second point, NDI recognizes the threat posed by computational propaganda to genuine organic discourse and looks forward to continued partnership with Oxford Internet Institute and others in the room. To close, let me just offer a brief word on NDI's response to the challenge. Recognize the importance of technologists to the future of democracy, NDI opened a permanent presence in Silicon Valley in 2013, led by our in-house governance team in partnership with the Institute's tech innovation team and others within the Institute. We have continued to expand our programming on civic technology, digital politics, digital security for democracy activists, and uh, preserving information integrity in political uh, debate online. We look forward to sharing more about our response at next week's event in Palo Alto. But components of our response include strengthening international and citizen election observation methodologies to include reviews of the impact of disinformation and computational propaganda in elections. Secondly, conducting new types of opinion research to better understand which populations are most vulnerable to disinformation in particular uh, political contexts. Deliberative polling shows how attitudes would change if exposed to more information. Implicit association tests help understand attitudes um, that might not be revealed in response to direct questions. Three, we are supporting global civil society partners to better identify, disrupt, and counter disinformation and build digital media literacy. Four, advocating for major social media companies to design for democracy, using a phrase from the Oxford summary, and take steps to reduce the extent to which their platforms are used to disseminate disinformation. Next, support continued dialogue and advocacy regarding tech policies that impact the future of democracy and politics online, and engaging with political parties on the appropriate use of online media as part of our 21st Century Parties Initiative. And finally, developing new IT tools for the use of civic and political groups. We look forward to engaging with our partners on hashtag DisInfoWeek events, including the Atlantic Council, Conrad Adenauer Foundation, Stanford University, Jigsaw, the First Draft Coalition, the Hewlett Foundation, and the Oxford Internet Institute. With that, let me hand it over to Laura Jewett, NDI's Regional Director for Eurasia, to introduce today's panel. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Hold on. Can you hear me? Is the mic on? Nope. Yes. Now it's on? OK. Yeah. All right. Thanks. And the ringing is off. So uh, first, a few words about format. This event is on the record, and it's being uh, live streamed. Uh, the hashtag for uh, those of you who may be uh, tweeting is Disinfo Week. Um, and for those of you who need Wi-Fi, the uh, Wi-Fi network is um, NDI Guest, and the password is democracy with um, a zero instead of an O. Sorry about the ringing. Move it up. Okay. Is that any better? Still ringing. Oh, well, that's worse. Yeah. Move this. I don't know how to do it. All right. 
that. Um, yeah. That's better. Uh, so uh, we are, as Ken said, we are delighted to be uh, hearing from the Oxford Internet's project on algorithms, computational propaganda, and digital politics. That's a mouthful. Um, about their uh, the nine case studies that they have recently completed. I'd, I'd note that NDI is working in some of the countries where these case studies were conducted, uh, but not uh, in all of them. So we don't engage, for example, in domestic U.S. politics. So we're deeply interested in this research, and we expect that it will guide a lot of our own work going forward, but we don't take positions necessarily on, on every one of their, their findings. I'm Laura Jewett. I'm the director of NDI's programs uh, in Eurasia, uh, the former Soviet Union. Um, Russia's tactics of hybrid warfare, including computational propaganda and disinformation, um, picked up momentum with the 2014 occupation of Crimea um, and have spread more recently to Western Europe uh, and the U.S. But these tactics have been standard operating procedure throughout Eurasia for more than 15 years. So Eurasia has really been on the, the front lines of this crisis. So um, on my team within, within NDI, we feel, I think, a particular urgency and a particular obligation to try to figure out how to get a handle um, on this issue and how to address it. Um, I'm joined by my colleague, uh, NDI colleague, Scott Hubley, who's the director of governance programs. He has supervised our presence in Silicon Valley since it was established, and with our tech innovation team, manages our global disinformation grants and projects. I will briefly introduce our uh, speakers from the Oxford Internet Institute, who will present the results of their research for 20 minutes or so. Afterwards, Scott uh, will make a few observations about the findings. Um, and uh, its connections perhaps to some of our work. And then we'll open the floor up to questions and discussion with all of you, which I know will be interesting. So first, to my immediate left, uh, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Philip Howard, who is Professor of Internet Studies at the Oxford Internet Institute and Balliol College at the University of Oxford. Is this on still? He gave his inaugural lecture at Oxford last week. Did this go off? I'll just speak loudly, uh, entitled, Is Social Media Killing Democracy? Computational Pro Propaganda, Algorithms, Automation, and Public Life. He has appointments as a professor at the University of Washington's Department of Communication and as a fellow at Columbia University's Tau Center for Digital Journalism. He's been a leading voice on the impact of digital media on political life around the world and is a frequent commentator on global media and political affairs. His research has demonstrated how new information technologies are used in both civic engagement and social control in countries around the world. And I should note that this is an encore performance at NDI for Phil in August 2013. He presented about an earlier book on digital media and the Arab Spring at a time when I think we had a more optimistic view about digital media in politics. To Phil's left is Sam Woolley, who's the Director of Research for the Computational Propaganda Project at the Oxford Institute. He specializes in the study of automation and politics with special interests in political communication and science and technology studies. His work on bots and public opinion has been published in several academic journals and collections and featured in publications such as Wired, Fast Company, Washington Post, The Economist, and Bloomberg. He's a PhD candidate at the University of Washington and a fellow at the Tech Policy Lab at the University of Washington School of Law. Um, and I had the pleasure of meeting Sam for the first time a few months ago back in Palo Alto. Uh, so with that, I will hand it over to Phil and Sam. Thank you. I'll stick with this one. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, uh, for coming. Good morning. Um, I'm going to start, uh, use my 15 minutes, our 15 minutes or so, to, to give you an overview, some of the comparative ideas, some of the consistent things we found across our nine country case studies. I'm going to share the floor with my colleague Sam in a few minutes to talk about some specific country case studies. Um, but first let me tell you a little bit about the project. 
uh, the project started in uh, 2014, uh, and it is significantly funded by the Re European Research Council. It actually started off with a seed grant from the National Science Foundation in the U.S. Um, it, was a, it was a grant to study automation over social media networks. And the program for this NSF grant was not particularly political. It was um, about figuring out how other actors are automating messaging. Um, so that NSF seed funding was very important to getting us off the ground. Here in the room today, we have a couple of authors um, available in case you have specific questions. Um, Dan Ornado has come in from Brazil. Uh, he's available to talk about his Brazil country case study. Would you raise your hand and just smile and wave? Um, Lisa Maria Nudert uh, is, the, is the lead author on our German country case study. And Samantha Bradshaw has also joined us. Um, she is authoring a paper that will be out in a month about global military expenditures on public opinion manipulation over social media. And that should be, we're not going to talk about that piece of research today, but that'll be uh, available in about a month. Our, um, our project is, is, the basic science of what we do is funded by the European Research Council, but in the presence of our researchers from overseas uh, is possible with the support of the Ford Foundation that's helped us uh, fly in some people to meet with you. And then, of course, thank you to our hosts um, who made this event uh, and breakfast possible and provided air conditioning, which I imagine might be one of the more significant expenses of hosting events in the summer in DC. So thank you. Um, I'm going to go through uh, the evidence that we have. And the goal here is to get you to have a look at the countries that are most interesting to you. Uh, we put online country case studies online yesterday morning. If you go to our project site, I assume everybody has a smartphone. Comprop.ox.ac.uk, all of the country case studies are there, including the executive summary. And most of the material I present today will be from that executive summary. So you're welcome to pull down any of the files as you like. If you find typos, don't tell me about it. I don't want to know about it. There won't be any typos, but I don't want to know about it. So first, I'd like to tell you about the evidence base here. Um, this is social science research, and one of the ways of describing social science is that it involves large amounts of evidence purposefully gathered. So these are research questions that we've had in mind for about three years now. The phenomenon is new in the sense that it's in the news media now, but some of the trends that we've been tracking are several years old now. And, and the, the craft of public opinion manipulation over social media is practiced at this point. We've got nine country case studies. This, of course, choosing countries means leaving some countries out. We aim for some diversity, a few authoritarian regimes, a few democracies, a few young democracies, a few countries uh, that regulate very heavily political speech on the internet, and a few that do have very few regulations. We're giving this briefing. We gave this briefing in London yesterday. We're with you today. And in two days, we go to Silicon Valley. The audiences, as you can imagine, are slightly different for each of these events. The Palo Alto event is about presenting our research um, to the um, policymakers in the valley, policy um, people who think about policy in the valley, to start to push this conversation ahead. And, uh, and something, that's, it, that's something that's very important to the NDI week-long initiative that's also happening in multiple cities. Now, we've got nine country case studies. Each is about 40 pages worth of analysis that's online. For the last year, we've also been doing incident-specific reports. One of the things we noticed fairly early on is that social media becomes a powerful tool for opinion manipulation when there's a crisis. Now, in democracies, the political crisis is often an election. I mean, that's the, the nice thing about democracies, right? They challenge all that energy and conflict into an event that's supposed to be well-organized and administered. So we knew in advance to be ready to track this phenomenon by the electoral calendar. It's easy to see when political actors are going to be expressing themselves over social media. Um, we're also able to track these events sometimes during complex humanitarian disasters. These kinds of events also have a social media spin to them. We've done a series of event-specific memos over the last year. And some of our scholarly research has, been, has um, involved the analysis of Mexico and Venezuela. On the whole, we have a fairly multi-method approach. And the magic of being multi-method is that you can choose to work with the big data analysis you get off social media uh, platforms with APIs that are accessible. But it often takes the ethnographic work, the interview time, the face-to-face -face time with bot writers and political consultants in country to do the, in 
to help with the interpretive work of the big data. So the large network maps that we can produce using the Twitter API reveal much about the structure of political conversation, but actually getting on the plane and going to meet the folks who generate this content brings home the punchline, helps us with the interpretation of this data. Let me say three things now about the overarching findings, the things that are pretty consistent from country to country. Across all countries that we studied in this, uh, in this project, we find that social media are significant platforms for political engagement, and social media are particularly important for young people. This is among the safest, most conservative conclusions we could reach. Right? <laughs> this is where young people develop their political identities today. And this is where they learn to express themselves. This is where they encounter news content. And we know that the way they encounter news contest, content has changed. Right? Some, some academics say it's changed in a positive way because more young people are actually getting more short clips of news on more diverse topics. And then other scholars say, no, no, the so, clips are so short that it's actually uh, changing what people know about politics. So I think it's an open debate over what the long-term consequences are for to the generations beneath, below us. But we know that the social media, social media is where they develop political identities. Across all countries, we found that social media are actively used as a tool for public opinion management across all countries. Now, this, is, this differs by regime type. So in authoritarian regimes, social media is now a normal tool for social control. It's, it's the way of getting propaganda out. Um, the Russian particular style of getting propaganda out involves seeding multiple conflicting contradictory stories. Right? So it's not usually about seeding one disinformation story. It's about seeding multiple ones that are all equally untrue. Even in democracies, though, this is a safe conclusion because in every democracy we studied, we found populations who are being experimented on. So political actors use social media to experiment on small subgroups of people, small subgroups of voters, on particular topics. This is consistent across all of the country case studies we studied. Everywhere we looked, we, we found this problem. The third overarching conclusion that I think is safe based on our case studies is that in every country, there is a fairly lively civil society community that's trying, and I think it's safe to say struggling, to respond. And the responses are varied. Um, sometimes they're quite aggressive. Uh, the Ukraine involves some very creative responses. The Ukrainian youth are quite used to these kinds of propaganda attacks, and they're, they're responding very aggressively, quite creatively, generating their own bots to respond to the Russian campaigns. In many other countries, I'd say it's a struggle, though. And one of the things we found across multiple country case studies is that social media automation and fake news is particularly powerful for attacking female politicians, feminist intellectuals, prominent uh, women um, in the media, in public life, are, are particularly soft targets for social media campaigns across multiple, multiple countries. Let me turn it now to Sam to say a few things about um, some of the particular countries. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, so as these folks said, I'm the director of research of the CompProp project at Oxford. Uh, thanks, Phil, for, for uh, giving me that great intro. I just wanted to also say thanks to Jigsaw, where I'm a fellow. Um, and uh, they've supported me in a lot of this work. Um, so what we're going to go into right now is trajectory. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the specifics of the cases. I, myself, am the co-author of the US case study, so that's where my deep expertise lies. But we're not going to dwell too long on the US today. Um, we're going to begin really quick with Russia, uh, begin at the beginning, the origins of computational propaganda. And uh, I think the question here is that uh, how did this all start? And uh, the brief answer from our Russian case is that it started with a very active blogosphere in Russia that was uh, working to uh, promote democracy across the former Soviet Union that was then um, basically squashed by active propaganda efforts online by the Putin regime. And so we saw the use of computational propaganda, but also what we call political bots, basically uh, automated profiles that look like people, but that are built to uh, bolster a particular idea online, uh, all throughout Russia. Uh, and then that translated to transnational campaigns for attacking uh, anti-Russian sentiment all over the world, including in the comment sections of uh, 
prominent newspapers, but also uh, across social media platforms themselves. The next uh, is the experiments that, that Phil mentioned briefly. So there's been several attempts by multiple governments to do experiments upon populations within their own country, but also to do disinformation campaigns across other countries. And so one of the things that we did in this study, to be clear, is that we sent our case study authors to the countries that they studied. Most of them are from the countries that they studied. And they did interviews with people who worked for political campaigns, who worked for uh, social media management firms, who do the building of the bots, and who do the launching of computational propaganda campaigns on behalf of political actors. We also talked to citizens. And we found that regular citizens also build a lot of bots and also launch a lot of computational propaganda attacks. So the experimental uh, kind of outcome of this is that in the United States, computational propaganda has been used for 10 years. It's not new. It's been used since social media has basically, the web 2.0 has been around. Um, uh, it's become much more sophisticated over the last few years, with automation playing a significant role in doing what I call uh, manufacturing consensus. So what it does is it creates the illusion of popularity. It, it, it bolsters a particular political candidate or political actor, and it gives the illusion of popularity across multiple social media platforms so that that person then has uh, basically a mandate to speak in a more legitimate fashion. Uh, the other thing that we've seen uh, in both of these countries is sort of the advancement of what I, again, what I call the democratization of propaganda. So multiple people can launch propaganda through a site like Twitter because of the open API. And it's something that I don't think that Twitter thought a lot about when they first began as a platform, but then now they're having to think a lot about because basically anyone with a bit of computer coding knowledge can build a army of bots that can then uh, work to manipulate public opinion. And lots of the people that I talk to are just people that are sitting in their house that run 500 bot accounts that have a very, very particular interest in getting across their particular opinion to lots of people. Um, the Ukraine is a case that I think it's safe to say uh, should serve as a warning to those of us in the room that are concerned with international democracy. The Ukraine is probably what computational propaganda will look like in five years if we don't do something. It's the most advanced case. It's been a testing ground for Russian propaganda for the last 10 years. And with Crimea, we're seeing uh, ramped up efforts in, on this. Um, read the Ukrainian case study if you want to get a look into how bad things can get. And when Phil says that the, the Russian method for spreading propaganda is to spread multiple conflicting stories, the Ukraine is the case in point of that. The goal is to confuse. It's not to necessarily sell a fake story. It's to make people so apathetic about politics and policy in general that then they don't really want to engage anymore. Consequences. So uh, Brazil, Germany, and the United States show us what the consequences of computational propaganda are in multiple sort of arenas. Okay? Uh, in Brazil, uh, in our Brazilian case study authors here, and I'm sure he's happy to answer questions after we all get done talking, in Brazil we've seen computational propaganda and bots play a role in three major political events in the last couple of years. Um, the impeachment process, uh, the current constitutional crisis and the municipal elections in Rio all were uh, attempted to be manipulated online uh, over social media. Um, in Germany, we see a bit of a cautionary tale about how perhaps a government should not respond to the perceived threat of computational propaganda. Uh, our case in Germany showed that while it, computational propaganda does exist in Germany, the governmental response was sort of overblown in response to it, like kind of, kind of a boogeyman in the room. And kind of uh, our German case study author shared yesterday that Angela Merkel herself said she's afraid of bots. <laughs> and so the response in Germany has been to uh, uh, talk about imposing massive fines upon the companies. And, and we don't really think that this is a, this one size fits all response is a very good response, to be honest with you. Um, lastly, in the United States, we see the consequences bearing out in politics and the spread of what we call, what Facebook has called false news, what we call disinformation or misinformation, and uh, potential effects upon the way that people perceive politics and think about events. The Pizzagate scandal is, is sort of one small example of a situation where many people legitimately believe that this was a problem. Uh, this scandal, this conspiracy was uh, propagated by bots. Uh, and by computational propaganda across multiple platforms, and uh, had actually very real offline consequences. Um, so with that, 
I think I'll leave it to Phil to do a few closing remarks, and I'm happy to answer specific questions about the U.S. case study, and thank you. So I, I fully agree with my colleague Sam that one of the real dangers here is probably over-regulation. Right, so there's, there's certainly something that to be done that I think we should expect of the social media firms in, in design and implementation and creativity, imagining ways to, to build for in democratic institutions into the platform that we're all using for politics. That, that's a key step we have to take. But over-regulation is also one of the, one of the very real threats. Um, it is very likely that Europe will make decisions in the next six months that shape what political conversation looks like in, in Europe. And we want to make sure there's some balance here. Um, I also think that we're past the point where industry self-regulation is sufficient. Right? So somewhere between industry self-regulation and public policy oversight has to be the magic point. I want to point you to three of my um, three nuggets, three things that are new, because some of what we're saying is sort of well known, has been covered in the media. In our Poland case study, we're actually able to talk ethnographically about one of these political consulting services that has maintained tens of thousands of accounts over 10 years, so as long as Facebook has been around, that involve a complete Gmail addresses, Twitter handles, Facebook profiles, and these things are um, for rent uh, for political consultants. They're hired by lobbyists in the West, um, political actors uh, who to uh, tweet and post in particular directions. That's new. We're able to demonstrate how Russian political conversation over Twitter is, is bounded. We estimated about 40%, 45% of the political conversation over Russian Twitter is through these highly automated accounts. That's a great example of capture of a platform. Um, so have a look at the particular country case studies because there's a, there are several nuggets like those in each one and we're happy to tell you more stories during the question and answer and um, why don't we turn it, Scott, would you like to start us off? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. I'll be very brief because I would like to get to the, the discussion, but just maybe a few more words and reflections and looking at the case studies uh, from NDI's uh, perspective. I mean, uh, However bad the situation appears right now, um, uh, it looks like things will continue uh, uh, to uh, get worse in terms of the technology is moving very quickly, the use of kind of uh, you know fake audio, fake video, social multimedia is coming online, uh, the pervasiveness of, of use of AI not just in disseminating but also content generation uh, looks uh, eager to grow or looks like it will continue to grow. I think uh, from NDI's perspective, I mean, we're looking at uh, a number of ways that we have currently been addressing this issue and will continue to going forward. Um, and I think the research gives, uh, gives us some additional direction. Uh, but I think there's, there's basically uh, five kind of main areas where we hope to, through uh, additional partnerships, the events in the next week uh, and continuation of our country programs where we want to kind of move this uh, forward. Uh, first, um, elections you mentioned is a crisis point. Um, you know, uh, NDI has done work uh, in monitoring elections throughout its, its history. Um, the methodologies need to uh, be updated and we're in the process of that and finding new partners to ensure that election monitoring globally pre-election assessments looks at the information space, uh, looks at um, issues of cognitive security and, and really addresses this component of elections. It's not, not about ballot stuffing, not about the pre-election environment, it's also about opinion manipulation. Um, I agree, we're past the point of self-regulation, um, but there's a, a need to build a community of advocates with the information and tools to push this in the right direction. Um, uh, there are amazing groups doing amazing things all over the world, uh, but it's not uh, shared uh, enough, and so that's part of uh, our mission. Um, third, just a bit about uh, parties. Um, as was mentioned, this is not just uh, many of the techniques that are being used by authoritarian uh, states have been adapted, are being used by a wide range of actors in ways 
that maybe are appropriate, maybe are not. The rules aren't clear. Uh, we need greater conversation within political parties on what's in bounds, what's uh, what's what's not. Um, I think there is also a role for uh, tools in this space. There was a great um, discussion in the um, in the Taiwan case study about an anti fake news bot. Um, uh, uh, supported by one of our partners in Taiwan, GovZero. Uh, basically, uh, you know, the bot is called Really or For Real or You Gotta Be Kidding. You friend uh, the bot. Um, if something comes into your social news feed or in, into your um, uh, social media uni universe uh, and you want to kind of fact check it, you um, forward it to the bot and get a response. There's a whole host of tools that way that are being uh, tools that are being developed to deal with these issues. Better tools to distinguish between organic and inorganic conversations online, uh, and we need to continue to scale those. Uh, share uh, share learning on what works and, and what doesn't. Um, and then lastly, uh, Laura mentioned. Uh, opinion research, uh, the research agenda here is so important. Uh, the work that Oxford's doing is just amazing. Um, uh, it's very country specific. Um, and so kind of uh, the work that we've been doing traditionally upon, uh, uh, traditionally about opinion research in countries, um, you know, there, there are new variants of that to get a better sense of disinformation vulnerability in particular contexts and uh, identifying the specific populations, pathways of disinformation, and, and how to, um, uh, you know, uh, get better quality information to the populations that are at risk. So uh, just a word of thanks from NDI about the uh, incredible uh, contributions that you're making and look forward to continued partnership uh, and also continued partnership from those in the room uh, on any of the issues that I mentioned. Uh, but with that, why don't we open it up for questions? And I think there are uh, handheld mics. Um, so uh, I'll hand this back to uh, Laura to moderate, but maybe I'll uh, just take the first question. Hi, I have two questions. Um, yeah, my name is Michael Vashon. Um, I work at the, uh, uh, at the Soros Foundation. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is, um, could you talk a little bit about the degree to which um, Russia at the state level has invested in this operation with its uh, intelligence services and its military? Um, because I think my impression is that it's quite significant in a way that's not really that widely known. So I'd like to learn a little bit about that. The other question is, to, to what degree have you found, and I, I guess either, you know, uh, anecdotally or from your research, to what degree are people becoming inured to this kind of propaganda? To what degree is skepticism, particularly among young people, rising? So I have a 16-year-old and a 20-year-old who, who, who I, my observation is they're not really, they, they don't really believe a lot of what they get on social media. And so a lot of the techniques that um, the manipulators may be trying to push down the pipe are already, um, people already have developed, a, or young people particularly have already developed, a, 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 a already inured to. So that, those are my questions. Thanks. Yeah, and I'd actually tag on to that if I could, because that's a question I have as a variation on that is in your research, I'm wondering if you found, um, are you able to identify particular populations or types of people or demographics of people who are either uh, inured or particularly vulnerable to disinformation and computational propaganda? Thank you. I think, um, let me start by answering these by saying something about the limits of the research, which you should always do. So one of the things that's very difficult for us is to connect a particular campaign to uh, voting behavior or a particular person's change of opinion. We, we can't link a tweet to somebody who changed their mind on who to vote for or what to believe from the Russian government. I'm going to tackle the Russian part of this question. The evidence we have, the evidence that's out there is patchy, but there are a lot of patches. So we know that there's a building with hundreds of employees in St. Petersburg uh, that, that with the budgets of millions of, millions of dollars dedicated to manipulating public opinion in other countries. We know that uh, major political figures around the world have small numbers of Russian bots that occasionally tweet in Cyrillic and then go back to tweeting in English. Um, for example, um, there's a small fraction of Trump's followers who announced 
the death of the Russian ambassador to the UN within an hour of the embassies releasing its press release. So much faster than you would expect many Trump followers to keep on top of Russian news and before any of the major media outlets had covered this as a story. So we can see occasionally these accounts in many different political figures follower, um, follower tracks. We know they have a significant staff. We also know that the, um, that in Russia there is a larger community of young people who go to summer camps and learn to tweet and post for the country. And so there's, there's paid staff and there are military units who've been, that have been retasked to doing this work. And then there's a larger community of fairly aggressive hackers and hacktivists who do this work. And then of course there's the multiple statements from um, the security services in this country about the degree of involvement in hacks and uh, communication strategy in, in the presidential election here. So as I said, it's, we don't have a paper trail of memos and paychecks to point to, but we have a lot of patches um, and we have outcomes. Just to echo what Phil said, I think that the one thing that's really important uh, and salient here and, and what we found in the Russian case is that um, that it's not hacking of computational systems, it's hacking of public opinion that's going on. And so, uh, you know, we think a lot of times about the ways in which, you know, voting machines might be hacked and, you know, not to, not to downplay that, but in our research what we found is that what's coming from Russia is incredibly organized and targeted at a variety of, of different news outlets, uh, organizations, and populations, and is geared towards changing them um, in a contextual manner and trying to get them to, to change what they think. And not, it's not one size fits all, it's very sophisticated. Um, and then to, to answer your second question about who's becoming inured to this and, and whatnot, uh, in the United States case, um, one of the things that we found, we did a qualitative study, uh, and I did the ethnography part of it, so just traveling around interviewing people from campaigns, interviewing people from uh, political consultancies, and then just uh, citizens all around the country. Um, and then we did a quantitative part where we studied Twitter and we studied the way that bots were interacting on Twitter. And, and what we found in that quantitative part was really interesting and that was that we can say that uh, with a very little shadow of a doubt that bots affected information flows during the United States presidential election. We can say that quite confidently. Um, and what that means is that bots reached very uh, uh, significant social um, arenas and were able to be retweeted by people consistently during the election as if they were actual people. And so one of the questions that always arises is, do bots even have an effect? Are they like, are they, uh, some, are they something we should actually be concerned about? And the answer from the US case study is yes. People do interact with bots, people do retweet bots. There's something else that I just want to say before I jump into the young people question, which is that um, the, the, way that, the way that manipulation occurs on Twitter isn't just by having a bot army or by having uh, the 50 cent army in China or the, the, the youth summer camps tweeting in support of your government. It's also to build armies of bots that are functioning in a quantitative fashion. They don't need to be sophisticated. They don't need to have a profile picture. They don't need to be triangulated across multiple platforms. Their goal is to retweet content that is hashtag specific or content specific in order to try to game the algorithm of the social media side at hand. And so if you think of it this way, you think of it, there's communication between bots and people or between the propagandists and people, but there's also com communication between the bots and the algorithm of the site in question. And so you've got to take that into consideration when you think these bot accounts don't look sophisticated, they can't share content that's going to change people's minds. Well, that's not their goal a lot of the time. Uh, and then as far as the young people question, uh, you're right. I think that it's, 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 it, that's success. That is what the people that I've talked to think of as success to have people in your, to have people saying, uh, I don't believe most of what I see online anymore. I don't really engage in news, like, what, what, like the skepticism about the mainstream media. And I mean, I can speak about that anecdotally, but I can actually speak about it empirically and, and to say that, to say that uh, across all of the countries that we studied, young people are particular targets of this misinformation. And the goal is uh, to create apathy. And the other thing is, uh, the, 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 one of the questions was, who else are targets? Phil mentioned women. Women journalists are often targets of this. Uh, women in general are targets of computational propaganda and harassment. Bots are often used to proliferate hate speech and attacks against journalists in, in attempts to have a chilling effect, to stop the journalist to get, uh, stop journalists reporting. That's in Turkey, Ecuador, and Mexico, and increasingly in places like the United States. Um, and then uh, we also see um, 
minority populations also being attacked by by bots. So uh, across multiple countries, we have problems with with and battle populations being attacked. Um, over here on the left, I just wanted to say, I just wanted to add on, Sam, that it seems like um, it's it's a good thing if young people are savvy and skeptical, but there's a fine line. Not a good thing if they become skeptical of all media and all news. So a fine line to follow. I was going to point over here on the to my far left. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lori McGlinchey with the Ford Foundation. Can you talk a little bit about um, what your observations are of the different platforms, the differences among the platforms, so the difference, say, between Facebook or Twitter, um, both in their own acceptance, sophistication, willingness to grapple with this topic, and also you mentioned the kind of continuum between the danger of overregulation and the failure of self-regulation. Do you have a sense of what the the levers of um, of uh, power are in terms of regulation. What it would what what might it even look like? Okay. Well, I'll, let me tackle the first one, uh, the second part first. And these are policy options that other people are talking about. So, in no particular order, they're not things that I'm uh, advocating for. But the list includes fines, uh, right? So the Germans are proposing twenty thousand euros per post per user of fake news that's served to a user. Um, that would very quickly add up, and um, uh, they would have to redesign for that. The other options people are discussing are algorithmic audits. So we audit video gambling machines, and we audit um, financial transaction software. And there would be ways of auditing um, Facebook's algorithms in particular that don't violate IP, but um, and do force some questions to be answered. And of course, if Facebook can't answer questions about how its own algorithms work, that's a problem too. And so algorithmic audits. Industry self-regulation and creativity um, would be another uh, coming up with programs to, to vet content. Um, and, you know, that's sort of where we are now. There's some very creative initiatives in particular countries. I think one of the challenges with that model is that, um, well, I think Editorially, I'd say that expecting civil society groups to do fact-checking on Facebook is inane, um, and not a policy response. Uh, so journalists you know, do need to generate good content, and we would like to see users uh, share professional news. But when we, when we went back to um, look at our Michigan data about who was sh what kinds of content people were sharing over Twitter, um, in the week before the election, we found that there was about a one-to-one -one ratio of professional news con content to junk that people were sharing. And the, the overall proportion of professionally produced news content being shared was at the all-time low the night before the election. So there's a rhythm to this stuff, and um, some creativity on the platform could help, on platforms could help address these problems. Yes, yeah, so that's uh, algorithms, uh, sorry, auditing the algorithms, <coughs> fines, and uh, self-regulation are among the possibilities. Um, the differences between the platforms. So most of what we talk about as researchers is, is Twitter, because Twitter's API makes it possible to study this stuff. And this is you know, a general methodology critique. We all think or hope that the observations we can make about Twitter networks will be revealing for Facebook. There are ways of studying Facebook uh, public pages, and we're starting to figure out how to do that. But on the whole, Facebook doesn't share data, doesn't collaborate well with researchers. Um, they have teams of data scientists in-house who could answer some of these questions, um, but they don't. And uh, there's no way to ever play with data and then publish in a scientific journal with Facebook because you can't get replication data. And to publish science these days, you need replication data. So Twitter is effectively what we study. Um, and they, uh, you know, I've spoken to their engineers in Seattle, and they're aware of the problem. They, are, they have in-house mechanisms for checking what, what bad behavior is for a user. And they, both firms rely on users to report bad behavior. Uh, over the last couple of elections, Facebook has, has shut down, just before the French election and the, the recent British election, shut down tens of thousands of accounts uh, that were fake. Um, 
probably associated with some of these firms in Eastern Europe that we found. To me, this sort of begs the question about what accounts they might have known about before the U.S. election and whether there are ways that we could help identify fake voters on Facebook. So I'd say we know more about Twitter, and we, we generalize from Twitter to Facebook, um, but now's a good time for Facebook to start sharing. Can I say a little bit? Um, I just, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come across as, across as a bit more positive. So I, I think that what you said is great, and I completely agree with most of it. But uh, what I, what I want to talk about the mechanics, first of all, of like the way that bot use plays out on Twitter and Facebook, but also about uh, the responses and uh, sort of about how things exist. Twitter's, uh, Twitter's and uh, employment numbers are vaguely the same as sort of or less than Google's Dublin office. Twitter's underwater on this problem. They can't really respond in a in, in the way that they might want to respond. Twitter is built to be an open democratic platform and the, the reason the API on Twitter is open is to share data and so that people can can do interesting things like build software and launch it through the Twitter API and that's a really important thing like that's something that Twitter is trying to do and I think that's one of the reasons that journalists and policymakers like Twitter so much and also programmers. The thing is, is that that also opens the door to large-scale manipulation, and that's very problematic, and that's what we're seeing now. So if anyone can launch a program, that buddy of yours that always talks on Twitter about politics now has a thousand accounts, that's problematic, right? Like, we don't want to hear from him a thousand times. Uh, and then um, on Facebook, so if someone can manage 500 accounts on Facebook, which is what we've, we've heard from bot makers in Poland and the Ukraine, uh, so you can, or sorry, on Twitter, the people can manage around 500 to 1,000 accounts on Twitter. Um, on Facebook, it's more like 10 or 15. So Facebook's doing a, a better job of, of vetting uh, profiles. Uh, we don't know a whole lot about how they do that or how it works, but we do know that it's possible to launch bots on the platform, and one of the main mechanisms for launching a bot on Facebook is by using the bot to run pages or groups. Um, and so Facebook has a real name policy, and that means that it's really tricky to build a uh, bot without getting it caught because they're verifying who you are. Uh, and most of the bots are proxies. They're, they're uh, an anonymous on purpose to try to get manipulation uh, to happen. But there's a really important thing to note here, and that's that Facebook and Twitter's network structure looks completely different. So Twitter, you talk to people that you don't know. <laughs> uh, let's just say that. On Facebook, you mostly talk to people you know. And so bots are more successful at manipulating public opinion when they are running groups or pages than if they were actually running people, people's profiles. Because on Facebook, if a strange person adds you, you're like, who is this? Even when my colleagues add me sometimes, they're like, who is this? <laughs> like, I, no, you're, you're my friend on Facebook, don't worry. <laughs> Be careful, though. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, so that's just a little bit about sort of what's going on. I think, I think that much more can be done. I think that in terms of responses, we've seen Facebook use the AP and, and Snopes to verify content. I think they need to take that further. Um, I think that uh, Twitter, Twitter's got to work to try to address the problem of automation on their platform. When we say that 45% of Russian Twitter is bots, that's a problem. You know, Twitter might not be a big platform in Russia uh, in terms of usage, but it is very influential. Okay. Hi, uh, David Sullivan with the Global Network Initiative. Uh, question for Phil. Uh, several years ago, you had a rather provocative piece that was arguing that we should employ pro-democracy bots to respond to sort of the early incarnation of this kind of phenomena. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, do you stand by that? or and, and how do you sort of think about those kinds of things in light of this research today? Uh, thank you. That is a hardball question. So <laughs> I... There's a couple of pieces, I've, uh, opinion pieces that I've written that were supposed to be intellectual exercises. One was, let's nationalize Facebook. Uh, and the other one was, uh, let's build pro-democracy bots. And so the reason I wrote that piece at the time was that it was clear that the Russians were writing these pro-democracy bots to attack my friends in Hungary. I was working at this, anti uh, sorry, uh, um, anti-democracy um, bots. I was working at CU in Hungary for several years. And so it, it was clear that the, the they were doing it. And, you know, it's, it's, we can think of tit for tat responses or ways to be creative. Um, and, you know, there are, uh, I should also say that some of this automation is, 
is positive, right? So there are bots that check when a politician tries to edit their page on Wikipedia, right? And they report those edits. Um, there are journalists who do creative uh, computational journalism, uh, ripping data out of public uh, public data sets uh, to, cre to to break news stories. And so it's not that the, it's not that the algorithms are bad. It's that these are, you know, we might default to the rule of law. These are political actors exercising speech rights um, who often describe themselves as patriotic programmers, right? They're, they're, writing for, they're writing to express themselves as why they do it. That's probably more true for, face, uh, for Twitter, um, where it's possible for individual users to do this stuff. On Facebook, Facebook manages the algorithm. So they, they manage the bots that set what chunks of news come from your feeds to act to, to the top of your, uh, from your networks to the top of your feed. I'd say that um, my, I, I haven't fully changed my mind. I, I'm not sure that I would write that piece again. But I'd also say that there are civil society groups who are thinking that way because they need a response strategy. And if they can write to a donor to say, give me money to hire a hacker to write some bots to address this thing that's because we're under attack, then it's also a self-defense issue. And you know, in my fantasy world, none of this would be happening because it, it definitely pollutes public conversation. So the question has become, do we want civic groups to pollute the conversations further? Can I just I don't know. And there's other kinds of positive social bots that exist. You know, uh, bo uh, we, Phil and I, and um, alongside several other colleagues, including uh, Tim Huang, who's a research affiliate with us, um, have written about bots as social scaffolding or as a social prosthesis. So the ways in which bots can act to connect networks of people who might previously not have been talking about a topic. And while we can't really run experiments on the ways that bots might affect a particular population for ethics reasons, uh, we know that bots have been used in the past to successfully connect um, to connect groups that want to talk about democracy, say for instance. Uh, the problem is that they're also used to connect groups that don't and that want to talk about hate or want to talk about control. Um, and I think that most of the time when we've seen, uh, when, we, when we can verify uh, with a large degree of certainty that it's been a, a government or a governmental actor that has launched a bot attack, the attacks have been pretty unsuccessful and a PR disaster for the, the governments at hand. And so, you know, the concept is like, you know, a kind of a bad one. It's, it's more about tactics than it is about strategy, and it it's, uh, it's, gets pretty messy pretty quick. Hi, uh, my name is Ivana, and I'm a partner at OMALAS, and we use machine learning to quantify the field of countervailing extremism and CT. And one of the user cases that we um, offer to federal um, clients is basically how to monitor and evaluate counter messaging campaigns. And so my question is a little bit more tactical, but um, so what we've been trying to do is study a lot of the really good uh, actors in propaganda, Russia, Iran, and Saudi. And so we're applying that um, against the Salafist groups to try to turn them against each other. Um, and so I just wanted to, and, but one of the really frustrating part of that entire conversation has been that we're constantly reacting rather than getting ahead. So how can we actually get ahead of that? Is that, is that more about like teaching civics in schools? Or making new bots? I don't know. Or making new bots. Somewhere between. Somewhere between. Yes. So I mean, if you could teach, if you could teach all the undergraduates of the world uh, the top twenty uh, argumentative fallacies as Aristotle expressed them, right? So if everybody learned what an ad hominem attack is, and everybody learned what, you know, post hoc ergo propter hoc, if everybody learned those things, they could read any news article pretty much and disassemble. So yes, it's about teaching civics. Um, you know, this is similar to, to David's question uh, in that uh, sh should. Should civil society groups be using algorithms to, to draw on their publics? Should governments be using these as part of uh, um, information warfare? I'd say, you know, on the one hand, it's too late because other political actors are doing that too. Um, you know, I, I'm not a security analyst, so I would just borrow the existing language and say proportional responses are relevant. Um, using social media to turn Salafists against each other sounds like a risky move. Um, but, but, I'm, but, maybe, but maybe it isn't. 
Right. So if a, if a U.S. government policymaker decides that it's worth turning Salafists against each other over over social media, then that's. I mean, I don't have any influence over that decision. But it seems that seems like a risky move. Of course, and this has to be weighed against the risk of not doing it things. You know, one of the things that, one of the things that did surprise me from this research was the absence of China in these conversations. We 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 expected to see Russian activities. We have found, um, you know, Russian involvement in um, co computational propaganda in Taiwan. We know they're active on all the issues that China is interested in, Tibet, South China Sea. Um, but they tend not to be active as much on English language social media. They've built their own separate information infrastructure from the ground up that is all about social control, and it tends not to involve automation as much as we expected. So. Um, of the things that keep me up at night, I think the uh, one would be that China decides to start doing this. Um, one would be, as Scott mentioned, the possible application of artificial intelligence to crafting messages. So not simply selecting accounts or you know sophisticated chatbots, but actually deeply crafted messages would be the next um, next step. And then in most of the countries we've studied, we found large networks of what we call sleeper bots. These are accounts that are clearly automated. They've only tweeted a few times about unrelated things, and they've gone to sleep. Uh, Twitter won't ca identify them because Twitter does not want to shut down legitimate users. So, so they're not, they don't pass the bot threshold for Twitter. Um, they're just waiting to be used for something. And um, you know, they might all get woken up at some key moment to be active on some issue. So those, those are the three things that concern me. Um, I'm still uncertain about the using Twitter to split Salafists. Yeah. So we have, uh, unfortunately, we only have 10 minutes left. I see there are lots of questions. What I'm going to do is clump um, about four questions and ask each of you to keep your questions very, very brief. And, and we'll, uh, we'll mill around hour. for half an hour. Until, yeah, yeah, we'll have there will be a little bit of time afterwards. So gentlemen in the blue. Lisa, Sandra, and here in the... Hi, my name is John Pope. I work at the Peace Tech Lab. And I guess I just wanted to check about, um, we talked about Facebook and Twitter and blogs a bit, but if you had seen anything in search and computational propaganda. Hi, Lovisa Williams from State Department. Um, actually, this question is from your online uh, feed. Uh, this is Shireen Mitchell, and she is the founder of Stop Online Violence Against Women. And she asks, does your report capture the data on how the bots are being used during elections to shut down vocal women of color, particularly black women in the US who are the largest voting bloc? Sandra Pepper, uh, Director for Gender, Women, and Democracy here, and my question has just been asked, really. Um, I think the key issue is, uh, is there a sort of a compendium chapter that you can actually glean on and uh, put together on the gender and women's piece, because I think it is absolutely critical. And the second thing is really to, to bounce off this young lady who was talking about Salafists and stuff, is have you started to um, look at the non-state actors at all, or is just that absolutely out of your um, out of your purview? Thank you. Good morning. My name is Daniel Clark. I'm from Cater Parks, Weiser, and Harris. Um, I'd be interested to know because it may soon become relevant here in the United States how computational propaganda influenced opinion in Brazil. Um, in particular, um, given the impeachment proceedings that happened there, um, how computational propaganda drove opinion and whether it was more of a disinformation campaign, and how that might indicate what might happen here in the United States. So, so I'll start with the start at the beginning. That seems logical to me. Um, so, what what role is this played in search? Uh, it plays a role. Um, our research isn't on search, so I don't want to speak uh, super super in depth about this. But what I can say is that we do know that you know bots make up 
50, 60 percent of all traffic on the internet. They're used for all sorts of purposes. They're an infrastructural part of the internet. And automation can be used to game algorithms in a variety of different ways. And it's all to do with the functionalities of how, say, for instance, Google Search works. So uh, if, if, you know, let's say hypothetically that it works through link structure, uh, bots can tweet lots of links all around the internet to get sites prioritized on a, on a search platform. Yeah. Uh, and I think Phil can answer maybe the, the other. So uh, for the Brazil question, I'm going to ask, I'm going to introduce you to Dan for later and perhaps during the, um, uh, during the break, the two of you could put your heads together um, on Brazil. The, so our strategy for tackling uh, the problem, uh, tackling how r this story plays out for race and gender has been to build that into each of the case studies rather than do a standalone one. But unfortunately, we've certainly found enough material to do a standalone study. Um, in this country, there have been several prominent African-American public intellectuals who've been driven off Twitter, um, basically, uh, from and artists who've been driven off Twitter, and comedians, and uh, the list is too long, right, um, because of uh, the harassment and trolls. And one of the things that makes this work tough is that the, the networks of people who do this um, come from different parts of our political culture. So the bots that tweet... Um, that har harass public intellectuals or tweet for a p particular political actor may come from uh, programmers in Silicon Valley who do one thing at night, uh, one thing by day, and then they go home at night and do some other uh, after hours work. They come from libertarians in Montana and they come from uh, Russia. And what's challenging is that these, these networks overlap. They generate content that each other's network picks up and runs with. And you know, I'm not afraid to say that an important network here is the pro-Trump network, which, which pulls content from Russia and from um, Trump supporters and from these other standalone networks that have been around for a while. And they all move in the same direction. So what's trouble, what's tough for us for sourcing is that um, these communities overlap and take each other's stuff and advance uh, an agenda that's ugly. Can I say a bit more, just really quick? Uh, one of the one of the key things about the the, the uh, question of how women are harassed using using bots, but also like computational propaganda more broadly, and that, and I'm talking women journalists, um, policymakers, uh, the whole gamut, is uh, is is I would say at least in the context of the United States, but also more broadly to look to look to 8chan. Uh, if you want to find out a bit more about this, 8chan is sort of uh, related to 4chan, but is is where you see a lot of this content originating. And uh, is is uh, it's a scary place, but uh, it needs to be studied more, and we haven't studied it. Eight Chan, like channel, eight Chan. So just one little, uh, I guess, comment from NDI's perspective about the response, and a, a little bit the question of kind of uh, how the CVE community kind of bleeds into this discussion. I mean, I think one phenomenon that we're seeing, and I don't have uh, as robust of an evidence base for this, but there is a lot of bleed over from the kind of security sectors into private political consulting that is uh, uh, means that some of the tools that are happening kind of say in the CVE space are being applied in all sorts of ways that um, maybe were not originally intended. So I'm also in the category of believing that we have to be very uh, careful about kind of where this uh, goes and, and it is a bit of an arms race. I think the response needs to be kind of uh, multifaceted. Uh, there isn't one bullet that will solve this. Uh, and on that point, I would just say there was a comment earlier about how the goal uh, of some of the Russian mis disinformation is to create apathy and discredit all news. Another aspect of it is really discrediting democratic institutions. Uh, and if you look globally, again, without establishing correlation, you know, kind of trust in democratic institutions has just nosedived uh, globally. Um, and so part of the response also from NDI's perspective needs to be the old fashioned bread and butter work of helping democratic institutions perform well having them integrate civic technology approaches that kind of perform services better, quicker to people. Um, so it's, it's a, it has to be a multi-level response, defensive, offensive, tactical, strategic. And um, we have our work cut out for us.
I apologize that we couldn't take um, all of your questions. We could have kept this discussion going on for quite some time, and it would be fascinating. Um, we will need to um, vacate the room, but I think there's a little bit of time where we can chat informally uh, for a few minutes uh, with Phil and Howard afterwards, if you'd like to stay. And so with that, I would like to thank Scott and his team for convening us and thank Phil and Howard um, for the research that you've done and for sharing it with us. Uh, it's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you very much.